Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to this workshop of Stormwater Awareness Week 2020. And hasn't this been a great week of learning all about stormwater? And today we've gotten to one of my favorite topics. This workshop is a passion of mine. I love talking about erosion. I mean, who wouldn't? I mean, you're here, right? You're watching this, this workshop. And uh, erosion is just a fascinating science to me. I love seeing it in the natural world. I love to talk about it with stormwater professionals. And it's always a challenge to be able to come up with effective erosion and sediment control plans and construction swifts. So I'm glad you joined us for this workshop. And hopefully you've been able to uh, take advantage of a lot of the other Stormwater Awareness Week workshops. There's just been some really good ones this week. Of course, you can watch them all recorded. They're online. Uh, each day at the end of the day after we show them they're online and they'll be up there for some time. Uh, we'll be seeing, you know, they'll be posted almost till next year's event. So, you know, if you if you missed one, you, you still have an opportunity or if you have a colleague or friend or somebody who you think might be interested in one of these topics, hey, pass it along, let them watch it. And, you know, the price is right, it's free. So anyways, we've been having a lot of fun this week and we've had over, uh, so far, uh, this is uh, Thursday evening, over 900 participants. So anyways, great event. So, but what we're gonna talk about right now is erosion theory. Yeah, I hear the groans out there, but hey, this is an exciting topic and I love, I love talking about it. So uh, let me uh, uh, share my screen with you and uh, let's take a look at uh, some some examples of erosion theory and and uh, let's let's look at some of these principles. So um, this talk's called Erosion Theory for the Real World: Four Practical Principles that we're going to be looking at. And uh, you know, uh, 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 before the pandemic, before the COVID pandemic really broke out, this was uh, early March. My wife and I and another couple got to go away and go to uh, a place I've always wanted to visit, uh, always wanted to visit, and that's Death Valley. I mean, I was so blown away by it. This is a erosion professional's playground. I mean, you couldn't ask for better examples of erosion. Look at this picture. I mean, they had alluvial sediment fans that were miles wide oh, I don't know, 50 to 100 feet, if not much deeper, and, and just amazing, amazing features of, of not just erosion, but sedimentation, and, and uh, it, it was just like a playground. You know, it was, a, it was all I could do but say, honey, stop the car. I want to get out. I want to go play. You know, of course, have, having my wife there, she, she kind of tempered that a little bit, <laughs> that enthusiasm. Uh, uh, she didn't just as quite get as excited about erosion as I do. Uh, but anyways, it was amazing, amazing. And, you know, uh, check this out. I mean, I mean, who wouldn't want to go wandering around in this? You know, it, this is like looking at a history book of erosion. You know, you got uh, deposition fields that later have been eroded and then deposited again and eroded again. And it's just amazing. So, you know, we've been doing, um, uh, videos. In fact, here in a moment, you're going to see a uh, small segment of our Grand Canyon video where we actually taught on erosion theory. And <clears throat> so we went to the Grand Canyon, did that. We uh, most recently went to Yosemite and did a series on restoration. Uh, two of those videos are out. The other two should be out later this this year. You can find those on our FORGE website. Uh, just go to wgr-sw.com, hit the training button, and boom, you'll, you'll have access to them. And, uh, but uh, my, our next video series, I've already decided where it's at. Death Valley. Death Valley is where it's at when it comes to erosion. And hey, I'm calling out a couple of my colleagues. David Franklin, you listening? And John McCullough, hey, you guys. You and I, you two and I, we're going to Death Valley 2022. You hear me? We're going to Death Valley. We're taking a video crew and we are going to go geek out on some amazing erosion and sedimentation features. So the rest of you can watch the video series when it comes out, but I'm calling out my two colleagues, probably the two 
most top professionals on, on erosion and sediment control in California, David Franklin and John McCullough. Uh, I want to I wanna take you guys there and we are going to have a blast. All right, well, enough of that, not the Death Valley. Let's move into talking about erosion theory. So what is erosion? Well, you guys know, you've probably been, some of you have been in my class before. You know what it is. I'm looking for one word. You know, that's what I always tell my students, one word that I really want, detached, yeah, you got it. It's when particles become detached. Now, how do they become detached? Well, they can become detached through different means. It could be through, uh, through water runoff. You know, that's what we usually talk about, stormwater runoff. Or it could be through wind, or it could be through gravity, or big cat dozers going through it. Now, the construction general permit in the glossary, Appendix 5, gives the definition. There you see it on the screen. But that, that one word that we really fixate on is detached. When a particle becomes detached from the ground, from the soil structure, that is where erosion starts. And that's where our focus starts. That's where we need to be looking at when we're thinking about erosion theory. Erosion theory is super important because, you know, if you don't understand erosion theory, you're not going to write a good SWIFT. And believe me, I see plenty of SWIFTs. I, uh, I also get to review SWIFTs and erosion sediment control plans for various municipalities. And too many times I see plans that just weren't well thought out. Or, or you know what happens is people get into um, a cookie cat cutter mentality. Basically wrote, oh, we got a perimeter, we got to put something around the perimeter. Oh, we got an exit, we need to uh, track out control. Uh, and it becomes kind of rote. And so they're doing things just because they always do it or because that's what we do. Rather than step back and look at the big picture and say, okay, but what is this site telling us? What, what do we see here? Uh, what, what is, you know, what's our erosion theory telling us that's going to happen here? And then once we got a good understanding of the big picture, we step in with some very specific things to address it. But in order to do that, you have to understand erosion theory. And until you understand erosion theory, you're, you're, you're liable to either have a SWIP that's not effective or to have a colossal fail. Uh, so uh, earlier this week, you might want to catch it, I had a workshop entitled uh, uh, Writing Effective SWIFTs That Don't Break the Bank. And uh, we talked uh, uh, about how to write a SWIFT that, that makes sense, that is realistic, realistic both for the contractor and, and the water board that is going to do the job that it sets out to do. And also, while we're at it, let's see if we can make it make financial sense too. So to do that though, you got to understand erosion theory. And that's what we're gonna be talking about, of course, you know, you, you can tell I'm a little bit passionate about it, right? All right. Well, in order to do this, uh, I'm going to take you to the Grand Canyon. You know, uh, what, what is my favorite place? Well, usually it's a national park. And uh, it depends on which national park I am in at the time. You know, when I'm in the Grand Canyon, it's my favorite place. When I'm in Yellowstone, it's my favorite place. When I'm in Yosemite, it's my favorite place. And now I have a new favorite, Death Valley. But um, let's take a look at this. Uh, this uh, little vi video segment talking about uh, the, the fundamentals of erosion theory. And then after the video, we'll come back and we'll apply that to, um, to our job sites. All right, let's take a look at this. Erosion. It's a process that many people take for granted. Actually, it's a process that breaks down granite and other types of soil. But what is erosion? Erosion is when particles become detached 
On a small scale, it's really not that impressive, but on a large scale, it's as impressive as the Grand Canyon itself. And that's why we came to the Grand Canyon, perhaps the world's greatest example of erosion. There are some phenomenal features here uh, that are due to erosion. And so we want to learn about erosion theory, but let's just talk about the Grand Canyon for a moment. It's an amazing place. It is 277 miles long. Now that's, that's a lot of erosion happening. But from here where I'm standing on Navajo Point to the North Rim, it is 10 miles across right here. And this place is deep, a mile deep on average. People who have done the math have put together the numbers to figure out how much dirt is missing from the Grand Canyon and it comes out to a thousand cubic miles. Wow, that is a lot of erosion. But the Grand Canyon doesn't come without controversy when it comes to erosion. The controversy centers around how the Grand Canyon was formed and it really boils down to this, two schools of thought, a little water over a lot of time or a lot of water over a little time. I, as an erosion professional and someone who studied this, I look at the principles of erosion and sedimentation when I look at the Grand Canyon. And there's a few things uh, in my field of study that tell me it was a lot of water over a short period of time. The first one is has to do with where we're standing. We're standing on the Kaibab Plateau. That is an elevation of around 7,400 feet. And across from us, looking straight across, is the North Rim. That's over 8,000 feet high. Now, below us, the Colorado River is flowing from east to west through the canyon. And that's where the rub comes in. Because you see, to the east of us, it's much lower. And same to the west. So how did the water get through? How did the water gap form? There had to be a significant erosional uh, measure or, or uh, event to have created that. And so that's the first uh, evidence that I have, that it was rapid canyon formation with lots of water over little time. Now the second one, if you look behind us, you'll see here that there are side canyons and amphitheaters. When we look at these side canyons, we actually see that there are no historic water sources of any significance. Uh, no historic creeks or rivers. So how did those side canyons form? That's always been a question. How did these beautiful amphitheaters form? Well, in erosion theory, there's this process called sapping. And when we have saturated soils with water and we have high flows moving perpendicular to them, it will actually draw out a lot of the sediments, the water uh, soaked sediments will be drawn out and basically cave in and form these small little side canyons, you, you might say. We see this happen on construction sites in uh, stream beds on a much smaller scale, obviously, but the same principle is occurring. High flow, saturated grounds, giving way and forming uh, these side depressions coming into the main area of erosion. And so another evidence that I point to is you'll notice that we have very steep walls and, and steep slopes. But if you look at the base of them, there's very little uh, evidence of rocks that have fallen and, and built up, uh, very little talus buildup. There's some, but not much, not accounting for long periods of time. Again, pointing to perhaps this happened in a, in a relatively recent history. But for me, I think the best evidence for rapid canyon formation comes from the erosion theory concept called dynamic equilibrium. The concept states that the amount of sediment eroded is directly proportional to the amount of water. You can think of it as a balance. On one side is the sediment load, which includes the amount of sediment and the particle size. On the other side is the hydrologic load, which includes the amount of water and the energy of the water. If we're going to move a lot of dirt, we need a lot of water, is what the dynamic equilibrium talks about. But in that, it also um, addresses two processes that happens. So when we have a lot of water, when, the, when there's a lot of water, we get a process happening called degradation. And degradation is where we get a cutting 
of the stream bed or the river or the bank uh, or whatever erosional feature we're talking about. So we get a deepening of those channels. Now aggradation is the opposite. When we get a heavier sediment load, that sediment's going to want to settle out somewhere. And so it starts to settle out and we start seeing aggregate in the stream beds. And that causes the flow to spread out. Now if we take the Grand Canyon in the Colorado River watershed, we see a classic demonstration of degradation and aggradation. Right here where we're standing, we see degradation, a, a distinct cutting definitely have removed a lot of material, steep walls, very much degradation. But if we go further down the watershed, outside the canyon, as we move further um, to the west and southwest, we get into these drainage fields where we see a lot of sand and, and sediment being uh, deposited. But the telltale sign is how wide those drainage areas are. They're very wide. That is where the aggradation happened. So, that dynamic equilibrium to me is the best evidence of rapid canyon formation over short period of time with lots of water uh, creating it. So as an erosion professional, I look at the Grand Canyon and go, wow, it's playing out these principles that we work with every day. And that's really uh, cool and pretty neat. Okay, so viewing the Grand Canyon as a result of catastrophic erosion is pretty uncommon and maybe a little controversial. But is it really such a wild assumption? The rills and gullies we see on poorly managed construction sites are just scaled down versions of the Grand Canyon and exhibit the same erosional features. Do erosion principles become irrelevant as the scale increases? Also, catastrophic erosion on this scale is not without precedent. There are other gigantic erosional features in the Western United States that are widely accepted as caused by catastrophic flooding or breached dams. Glacial Lake Missoula was obviously formed by glacial melt. An ice dam held it uh, in place and at, finally at some point it gave way. Now it may have been two, three or more events. There may have been even several events. But that is basically what formed the uh, scablands of Eastern Washington and, the, and some very Im impressive erosional features like the Palouse Canyon. Take also uh, into consideration the Snake River Gorge. The Snake River Gorge, very deep, uh, very much a, a demonstration of degradation. But the Snake River Gorge was formed by ancient Lake Bonville when it breached the dam at Red River Pass. It breached there and the water flowed to the west and formed the Snake River Gorge. We even see examples like this more in the um, current times, uh, like Mount St. Helens. Uh, there are some very impressive canyons that were formed over very short periods of time. In some cases, days, weeks, months at the most, form canyons that are even deeper than 100 feet, having characteristics very similar to these other erosional situations that we see all over the western United States. Well, that's some of the history of the Grand Canyon. But what can we take away from here when it comes to soil loss, erosion, sedimentation? What lessons can we learn from the Grand Canyon? Well, that's what the United States government was wondering in the 1930s. When another catastrophe happened, this time a man-made environmental disaster, it was called the Dust Bowl. And it was a situation where farmers had plowed up copious amounts of ground there was a lot of exposed soil uh, open to the environment. And then when windy conditions came up, it basically created an environmental disaster. And so the United States government through the uh, Department of Agriculture really began to study it and look at it. Why, why is this erosion happening? And what can we do to control erosion, to control sedimentation? What kind of conservation methods can farmers use when it comes to managing uh, their fields in order to avoid this type of erosional event. So the um, Department of Agriculture uh, formed this equation based on observations and uh, empirical data. It was called the USL, Universal Soil Loss Equation. And basically, 
It took all the data that they had been gathering and put it into one formula where they could come out with a way to predict soil loss and also to be able to quantify the benefits of good soil conservation methods. Now, over the years, that equation has been refined and revised, and today it's called the Revised Universal Soil Loss Equation, or the Russell. The Russell is based on more evidence and more studies that have been done. But to understand erosion, we really got to take a look at the five stages of erosion. A lot of people don't realize that erosion actually progresses through five distinct stages. And I brought a graphic here to kind of illustrate that for us. And the first stage is the raindrop falling out of the sky. It's when the raindrop hits the ground and basically breaks loose other particles. Each raindrop's like a little miniature bomb, actually. It's traveling at five to 20 miles per hour. And when it hits the ground, it actually creates a microscopic crater. And the fines are blown out and it leaves an indentation. Now, one drain, raindrop doesn't result in a whole lot of erosion, but you multiply that over millions, if not billions of them, it adds up. That's a lot of erosion occurring just from the rain hitting exposed soil. Now that leads us to the second stage, which is sheet erosion. This is when those raindrops come together and they start forming a thin film traveling across the exposed soil. That actually can account for quite a bit of erosion. But the problem is, is a lot of people don't really note it. It doesn't have those tell, telltale signs that the next stages have. Uh, they might see brown water leaving the site, but they don't see the, the markings of it. But if you look closely, especially over a series of storms, what you'll notice is that the aggregate will start to become more pronounced. You'll start to see gravel and pebbles and coarse grains of sand. Well, why is that? Well, it's because the fines have been washed away. And that can actually account for a lot of erosion. Now that leads us to the third stage. And that's as the sheet flow condenses, it starts going through paths of preferential flow. It starts to form these little tiny channels. In erosion theory, we call those rills. And those rills are actually a hundred times more erosive than, than the sheet erosion. And they will travel from maybe the top of the slope or midway down the slope, and they'll start forming generally after 10 to 20 feet of sheet erosion. Now, when those rills start coming together, that brings us to our fourth stage of erosion, and that's goalie erosion. Now, the working definition of a rill is something that can easily be stepped over. It is pretty small. But the goalie, on the other hand, this is something that you can stand in. You're not going to easily step over it. Erosion has progressed, and now we're gouging out a lot of soil. Goalie erosion is 100 times more erosive than than rills are, and now we got considerable soil loss. And that takes us to the final and fifth stage of erosion, and that is called stream bank or sometimes channel erosion. And this is where the erosion is happening more maybe downstream, off the site. It's, it's more a watershed issue. It is a cutting away the banks. Earlier we were talking about degradation. That would be a form of of stream bank erosion, where we get the deepening of the sides, the cutting away of the, of the stream banks. And so that is typically happening probably as a result of the other forms of erosion that preceded it. So that's why we came to the Grand Canyon, is really to, to look at this great example of erosion, some of these phenomenal erosional features, and to take the Russell equation and to, to use what we're seeing here in the Grand Canyon to help us understand this equation. Now here it is for the first time. It's A equals R times K times LS times C and times P. Now in the next four video lessons, we're gonna focus on these Russell equation variables. But for now, why don't we look at what we're solving for, and that's A. Now, A is soil loss, but we gotta give it a unit of measurement, so we're gonna give it tons. 
Now, tons per what? We're going to assign it tons per acre, or we're going to say average soil loss per acre expressed in tons, but over what course of time? Well, those who developed this said one year, a whole one year cycle of a rainy season. So A equals the annual average soil loss per acre in tons. Now for alliteration purposes, just so it rolls off my tongue, lots of times I'll say average annual acre tons. But you know that we're talking about soil loss on an annual basis uh, expressed in tons per acre. And so we're going to now take a look at this equation and what we can learn from the Grand Canyon. So why don't you grab your pack, maybe a water bottle, and we're going to head on over to one of my favorite locations in the whole Grand Canyon, and that's Hermit's Rest. And we're going to learn about the R value, but also about erosivity, climate, and sedimentation. So why don't you join me? All right. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, I, I loved that video. You can tell we had a lot of fun, huh? I kind of like the Grand Canyon. Doesn't that make you want to go? I, I mean, who wouldn't want to go there? You, you got to go. Sometime maybe we'll do a, a giant, uh, big uh, uh, group field trip to the Grand Canyon to go go explore some cool erosion features. Hey, just a little trivia about that. Um, that music was all original score, uh, composed and played by none other than David Franklin. Uh, so he's not only a great erosion control specialist, he's quite the musician too. And so uh, we got his permission to use that music in that, in that video and uh, that's his work. So go check out his website sometimes. I think he's got links to, uh, to uh, his, his music. So, uh, all right, well, in the video we talked about Russell. And here's the Russell equation here. I'm gonna take a look at it from a slightly different aspect. Oh, by the way, if, if you wanna watch, that is a, that uh, was the first uh, segment, that video was the first segment of a six part video segment that is on our Forge website. Uh, you can watch those other lessons uh, for a very uh, nominal subscription fee and see, uh, learn about all these variables. But I wanna look at it slightly different than what we typically look at. We're gonna look at it as a group. So R is your erosivity uh, factor, and that is a function of, of the location and the starting and ending date of, of the construction. And K is called the erodibility factor. It's a function of the soil type. You know, there's three basic soil textures, sand, silt, and clay, uh, where, where silt is the most erodible, sand's the least erodible. And then there's LS, which is the length of slope and steepness slope, or it's a function of the length of the slope and steepness slope. Those three factors in red there, those basically don't change typically for a site. You're not gonna change the location of the site. The soil is what it is. Uh, and the length of slope, steepness slope can change a little bit as the, as the site progresses, especially a site that has a lot of grading in it, but still it's not gonna change that much usually. So those in the red, typically are non-negotiables. We're not really doing anything with them. They're going to be just what they are. Now, the two factors you see at the end, C and P, that are in the green, those are something you can do something about. C standing for cover, P standing for practice. Those are two variables that we're going to play with to um, be able to improve uh, our control over erosion. And so uh, that's why it's so important to know your erosion theory. You got to understand Russell and what, what we can uh, work with. So using that, we're going to look at some real world principles and I'm going to list them out here. Um, first off, we're going to talk about the principle of eliminating the accelerators. And so I'm just going to list out these first and then we're going to circle back and talk about each one. And then the other one is we're gonna slow the flow. Principle number two, get it to slow down. Principle number three, kind of related, but a little, little bit different focus, torture the path. This is a, a, a phrase I coined, torture the path. And then the last one is eliminate the impact of the raindrop. 
So we're going to take a look at these uh, for the balance of our class, these four principles. And you know, when you understand these principles, you'll be able to ride an effective SWIFT. You'll be able to spec out erosion and sediment control measures that have a very good chance of working. Now, it is a complex field. It is, um, the uh, we're always working with very dynamic situations. So uh, I don't think any erosion professional will guarantee this will work. We all hope it will work. We all think it will work. It has worked in the past, but you know, some sites are just very, very dynamic and it is a little bit of an iterative process, meaning that we apply what we think is going to work, we let it work, and then we evaluate or reevaluate and go, hmm, that didn't quite work as quite as well as I thought it would. So maybe we need to apply something else. So with that in mind, let's let's take a look at each one of these. So principle number one, eliminate the accelerators. Well, the saying is time is the great healer. You know, give it enough time and it will heal everything, right? That that everything can be resolved with enough time. Well, that's not necessarily true, and especially not true when it comes to erosion. Um, let's take a look at this picture that I took at the Grand Canyon. Actually, at the place I was talking about, this is Hermit's Rest, down the trail from Hermit's Rest. And um, in this picture that I took, I, I was just geeking out about this. I mean, check it out, no less than seven forms of erosion in a single picture. Well, let's start at the top there, freeze-thaw erosion. Uh, a lot of people go, wow, I thought the Grand Canyon was pretty warm. Yeah, it can be warm. But as you saw in the video, up on the rims, the south rim's around 7,000 plus feet and the uh, north rim's even higher at 8,000 plus feet. It can get quite cold. In fact, when we were filming that, that uh, uh, video series in March of 2018, it did get quite cold. In fact, that last day, we were always trying to beat the snow. And that last day, it was actually snowing. You have to watch the video and see see me talking about, uh, I think it was talking about cover that day, the, the, the C factor in the snow. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but anyways, uh, the Grand Canyon also has lots of cracks in the rocks. And when the water gets in there and it gets cold, that water uh, freezes. And when water freezes, turns to ice, it expands. And that's like, a, that's like breaking apart rocks. So that's a form of erosion right there. Uh, coming down from there, we have next a rain erosion. And of course, you know, anywhere it rains, you're going to have erosion, just like what we talk about normally. But something you might not normally think about is plant erosion, kind of like freeze thaw, only this time it's not ice, it's a seed, a very small seed, maybe from a pine tree, gets, uh, goes down into the rock. In fact, you can see a pine tree back in the, in the background there, gets down into the rock and it germinates and it starts to grow. And those, those plants, even small shrubs like you see in the foreground here, can exert enough pressure to start breaking apart rocks. And then there's also chemical erosion. That's that white film that you see on a lot of those rocks. It's actually a carbonate uh, type of reaction that if you were to rub your hand along that rock, you'd feel it very crumbly from the carbonate uh, reaction happening there and breaking down the face of the rock. Another type of plant, uh, part plant, part animal is lichens. Lichens uh, break down rocks and um, uh, lichens are beautiful, but they break down rocks. And then of course we have wind erosion and it can get quite windy in there. And then of course we have what erosion caused by man basically on the trail. Uh, you know, Grand Canyon gets a lot of visitors. And I've seen the stats where the people that go down these trails every day, every week, every month, all year long, it adds up to thousands and hundreds of thousands. You know, the park gets millions of people visiting it. Not everybody goes down the trail, but it's nonetheless quite a bit of traffic. And so there you go. You got seven forms of erosion. So time is not on the side of erosion. Erosion's happening, whether it's in the Grand Canyon, or in the Sierra Nevadas, or on your job site. Erosion's happening every hour, every day, every week, all year long. It is constantly happening. Time is the great perpetrator of erosion. And so it, what we want to talk about, though, is accelerated time. 
Um, so, you know, natural erosion, like for the most part, what we saw in that last slide, is generally fairly beneficial. You know, we wouldn't have the great beaches that we have here in California or the wonderful farmland that we have in the Central Valley in the California Delta. That is all benefited, all that benefited from erosion in the past and even ongoing erosion. But what we talk about in this field of controlling erosion is are the accelerators. We don't want to speed up time. Time is enough of our enemy as it is, right? All of us are getting older. Uh, so we definitely don't want to speed up time and that's true for erosion. We don't want those accelerators. So uh, what are those accelerators? Well, if you've been to any stormwater talk, you know what we're talking about, right? Removing vegetation. The moment we take a vegetation away, that's an accelerator. Exposed dirt will certainly erode faster than covered dirt. Uh, but that top layer of soil typically has a whole lot more organic material in it. I really learned this a couple, couple ways. We had a soil scientist for, from the Natural Resource Conservation Service come in, Ken Oster was his name. He came in, we, we interviewed him, did a, a film uh, uh, interview with him a few years ago, and he did this this experiment that just blew me away. He basically took two uh, two liter Coke bottles um, that had the wrappers removed, you could see through them, uh, put in a quarter inch mesh on the top, filled them up with water so the mesh was under, under the water and so we could see through them. And then he took two clods of dirt. He said he had gotten those clods from the same field, same field, same soil type. The only difference was how they were managed. They were managed differently. One was from an area of the field that had been tilled traditionally, um, as, as farmers do every year, tilled up. The other was from an area that had relatively been untouched, it was no-till. It had really had not been tilled. It had been managed differently, but same soil types. He put them in the, in the, in the two-liter bottles, resting on the mesh, and the results were remarkable. The one that was from the tilled area just immediately fell apart. While the other one stayed intact. In fact, you couldn't really see anything falling off of it. And so what was the difference? The soil types were the same. The difference was the presence of organic materials. The one that had not been tilled up maintained its structure, maintained its organic mass uh, and, and uh, uh, had still the glues holding it together. And, and that organic material held it together. Another time that I saw this play out was kind of unintentional. We have in the back here, uh, what we call our construction sandbox. It's basically a place that we use for teaching, but we also use it to test out BMPs and do different things. And so we have a slope that we try different configurations of BMPs and we change it out from time to time. We had it sprayed with hydraulic mulch and was testing that out, but we wanted to reconfigure it. So I had my guys go out there and break it up, break it up, disturb it. You know, I wanted bare soil again. So we did that. And then we ran our next experiment and we were expecting to get, you know, colossal fail. You know, we were expecting to get bad erosion because we had disturbed soil. We were so disappointed when we didn't see erosion happening. And we took a closer look at it and I was like, okay, what, what's going on here? Well, even though we had completely disturbed that hydraulic mulch, even though we raked it up, dissed it up, got it, you know, disturbed, there was still enough organic residue in it to basically not allow us to get the erosion we were hoping to get. You know, um, the Natural Resource Conservation Service talks about that with farmers. They talk about maintaining residual organic material in the soil, and that's why. When you have organic material in the soil, you're not going to get the erosion. Now, if you move that, remove that top soil from the site and you go down to the next horizon, maybe the sea horizon, where there's no organic material in there, that's an accelerator. You've sped up erosion by uh, exposing soils now that have no organic material. Uh, my, my good colleague and friend, um, Craig Kalaji, he's giving several workshops this week on compost, the benefit of compost. And that's one of the big benefits is to, to prevent that accelerator from happening. All right, and then of course, unprotected slopes are an accelerator. 
And then uh, construction site activity, movement, activities, disturbing soil, those are accelerators. And the last one here is one that a lot of people don't think about, and that's, that's actually the development itself. Paving it, building it, you go, wait a minute. I thought if we made impervious surfaces, we'd certainly reduce erosion. Well, you do on that site. But the problem is you might actually be accelerating erosion offsite in the watershed. And so these are real world accelerators that we have to pay attention to if we're going to write effective SWIFT. Now let's go to principle number two, and that's slow the flow. Slow the flow. All right, true or false? A smooth, compacted site worsens erosion. What do you think? Is that true or is that false? You can type that in if you want. What do you think? Yeah, uh, you know, a lot of people say false. No, no, a lot of people think, you know, yeah, you smooth it out. You know, I even had a site here, uh, uh, it was like a 10 acre, pretty flat site, maybe 2% slope at the most. And they were trying to get ready for the winter and they brought in the rollers, <laughs> the compactors. They made it super smooth, super compact. Oh, uh, we're gonna stop erosion. And I'm like, no, you just are, you just have worsened it. Why, why do we say that? Well, let's take a look at this. The answer is true. A smooth compacted site does worsen erosion, but why? What's the P factor? You know, we talked about Russell, C and P, C being covered. P being what we do to the site, the practice. Uh, take a look at this, this uh, table that also came out of the Dust Bowl era as, as the USDA was uh, working with farmers on soil conservation techniques. Um, the, uh, the top one there says compact and smooth, scraped with a bulldozer or scraper up and downhill. And what factor do we apply? A 1.3. So anything over one, is going to worsen it. In fact, this 1.3, you've worsened erosion by 30%. Now go to the bottom of the list. Rough irregular surface equipment tracks in all directions. You know what that is? That's a, even a bad job at track walking. Even a bad job at track walking will put that number under one. So at 0.9, that's a 10% reduction in erosion. Even a bad job at track walking. A good job would certainly uh, be even better. All right, another uh, uh, along these lines is velocity is an enemy to erosion control. Slow water is our friend, fast water is our enemy. So we want to slow the flow down. And how do we do that? We do that by putting up obstacles. And that takes us to real world principle number three torture the path. <laughs> what are we talking about? All right. When we have a flow going across the site, no free rides, okay? You do not want water getting from point A to point B fast and efficiently, not on a construction site anyways. Maybe afterwards, but not on a construction site. We need obstacles. We need to slow the flow. What kind of obstacles are we talking about? Well, you know, you've seen them, right? You've seen stuff like this, these linear sediment controls. If you've driven down any of the freeways here or highways in California. You've seen Caltrans install something probably very similar to this. It doesn't always have to be fiber roll, but the idea is as, as water flows down the slope, it's in the sheet flow, and uh, before that sheet flow can then go to the next erosion step, and that is rills, we want to stop it in its tracks and basically reset the clock. So, uh, depending on the percent slope of the slope, um, 10 to 20 feet is where we want to put our next barrier. Now, it doesn't have to be fiber roll. It could be other things. It could be gravel bags. It could be compost socks. It could be terracing, benching. It could be a roadway. It could be various things, but we want to stop that flow, reset it, and get another 10 to 20 feet. And therefore, we can walk it down and avoid progression of erosion steps. We'll still have raindrop, we'll still have sheet. That's why we also, as you can see uh, here, need to have an effective soil cover on that. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Track walking, we talked about a bad job of track walking. Here's a good job of track walking. You want your equipment going up and down the hill so the tracks are parallel 
with the contours of the of the site. All right. I've seen it done the wrong way, and it it's not pretty. Basically, if they're going up and down, you're just providing a very convenient path for rails to form. So, but track walking is actually a great way to control erosion. Now, track walking is the one BMP that doesn't, it, it, it's not exactly an erosion control uh, measure, and it's not exactly a sediment control measure. It's kind of a hybrid, it's kind of both. Um, it is both a sediment control and erosion control. It's one of the few that, that goes into both sides of our BMP toolbox. So uh, track walking will definitely be one obstacle, a very good obstacle, especially on slopes. Um, check dams and swales. Here's a beautiful job being done. A, a, a swale that has been stabilized. You can see the hillside stabilized. You see the roadway stabilized. This is a wonderful BMP application. I wish I could claim it as mine. Uh, but uh, And there you see the compost socks acting as our check dam. So it's not even getting, the water's not even getting a free ride down that nice, pretty, stabilized swale. It's, it's being hit. Each one of those green socks is, is slowing it down. And not only is it slowing it down, but since they're compost socks, it's actually helping clean the water. It's filtering it too. Awesome, awesome uh, display of BMPs there. Uh, the other obstacle are fat spots in the line. You know, there's no slower water than a lake, right? Or a pond. So basically we want water to hit a fat spot in the line, be it something this size or even much smaller, but basically when it hits something like that, it immediately slows down. And so sediment needs to fall out. They're called sediment basins or traps for that reason. And then uh, here's another application of compost socks. This isn't so much a swale, but again, being able to slow that flow down. All these are obstacles. Of course, treatment trains. Um, I won't say too much about this because we had another workshop earlier this week uh, where we featured our construction sandbox and actually showed this in operation. But this is a great way how to torture it just at the last moment before it goes into a drain inlet how to, or an outfall and, and uh, torture your, your flow and get a lot of work done by removing sediment, improving water quality. And then of course, right at the end, at the drain inlets, that's our last opportunity to do it, to, to torture that path and to get particles to settle out. So let's now go to the last principle, number four. And this is where we eliminate the impact of the raindrop. Of course, if you've been to any of our um, uh, QSP, QSD classes, we talk about junior raindrop, and we talked about that in the Grand Canyon video, how each one of these is like a miniature bomb coming down and uh, ha having an impact on the soil and blowing out the fine particles and starting the whole process. So if we want to prevent the erosion from, from progressing, let's start it right at the beginning. And so here's uh, another picture of uh, of where you can see the craters and pedestals. Now this is more sandy material, uh, probably more uniform in size. And so in sands, it just moves it around a little bit, but you can visualize it a little bit. So there's two basic approaches to how to um, prevent Junior Raindrop from doing his damage. Uh, the first one here is preserve. Preserve, uh, we call it EC2, preserve existing vegetation. Uh, and you see in that first picture with the uh, orange uh, environmental sensitive uh, fencing, ESA fencing, how it, it clearly delineates on the other side of the fence, we got disturbed soils. On this foreground, we have nice green grass, right? Now, um, it could be that that nice green grass is the neighbor's yard and he'd be quite ticked off if uh, construction activity was moving into his yard. Uh, so that might be the practical reason for that fence, but nonetheless, that fence is maybe not keeping sediment from going into the green grass, but it is keeping the construction activity from going into the green grass. And so, uh, uh, by preserving that off-site green grass that is protecting that area, junior raindrop falling on this side of the orange fence isn't going to do much damage. 
But on the other side of the fence, at some point, they're going to have to think a different strategy, and that is the other picture, cover. Of course, uh, this is where we usually, in our erosion sediment control plans, focus on is getting a cover down. Now, some people think, man, the, the, it's like the State Water Board thinks that construction activity doesn't involve disturbing soil. You know, it's, uh, it's like they don't expect us to ever disturb soil, like, you know, no, no, they understand what construction is about. They understand that, um, that it is necessary to disturb soil. But what they're saying is the importance of not disturbing it until you need to, and then getting it covered as soon as possible after it's been disturbed, either on a temporary basis um, or on a permanent basis. Once again, there's some, been some wonderful workshops this week on on temporary and and uh, permanent BMPs, uh, Mike Lewis, one of our QSPs, gave a great uh, workshop where he actually showed sites, actual construction sites where that was occurring. So you might want to check that out. So let's just let's just review here. You want to write effective SWIPs. You don't want to get failure on your job sites. Well, you got to understand these principles. you got to understand your erosion theory. And so uh, let's again review those. Let's eliminate those accelerators, slow the flow down, torture the path, get as many obstacles as you can. You know, sedimentation is not the problem. We want sedimentation to happen on site, not off site. And then eliminate the impact of the raindrop. All right. And if you understand if you understand erosion theory, you understand these principles, you too will have effective SWIPs. You'll have well-managed sites. All right. Well, it's been a pleasure uh, talking with you all today. I hope you enjoyed this Stormwater Awareness Week uh, workshop. I, I hope you can take advantage of quite a few of the other ones. Um, here's my contact information. Feel free to contact me. I would love to talk to you about um, uh, particular sites. Uh, we actually have a saying here at WGR that advice is free over coffee. And I have people call me up on the phone and say, John, pour yourself a cup of coffee. We need to talk. So uh, we can do that. Uh, there's my phone number, my email. You know, reach out to us. I would love to hear from you. And maybe someday we'll even go to Death Valley, huh? All right, well, you guys have a good Stormwater Awareness Week. Uh, and uh, thank you for uh, being a part of this workshop. See you soon.